I must apologise that a peculiarly vicious summer cold hit me over the uh, May bank holiday. Uh, I think it's on the wane, but uh, it may sabotage my voice, but I will try and not fade away before the hour is over. So we now come to the second part of Tom Thomas Cromwell and the Monasteries. We left the story at the end of 1533. We're jumping now to 1534 which was the first year in which you can see real signs that Thomas Cromwell grafting uh, his own evangelical religious agenda onto that otherwise neutral political event, the, the break with Rome. It need not have had any connection with the Protestant Reformation, but it was pushed in that direction by Archbishop Cranmer and Cromwell taking the lead. And it was also the year in which Cromwell began collecting the formal powers to help him push this agenda. Because this was the year in which Henry's regime discovered that a great many questions remained unanswered about the new Church of England. That was embarrassingly revealed by Archbishop Cranmer's launch in May 1534 of a metropolitical visitation of the province of Canterbury. And this was patently aimed to lay his clergy open for whatever measures of reformation the king would allow him. Naturally, Cranmer started with his own diocese, Canterbury, but he then moved outwards across the whole province of Canterbury. And straight away, Bishop Stokesley of London spotted a fatal flaw in the plan. Cranmer's own official title under whose powers he acted. They still contained the phrase, legate of the apostolic see. Astonishingly, no one had thought to get rid of it. And with infuriating punctiliousness, Stokesley and the Cathedral Chapter of St. Paul's courteously pointed out that to accept the Archbishop's visitation was to accept this obnoxious papal title and lay themselves open to all the disgrace and horror of the statutes of Preminari. Over the next few months, Bishops Longland of Lincoln, Nix of Norwich, and lastly Gardner of Winchester, all took their cue from Stokesley, ingeniously ringing the changes on this theme. Looking back over the events of the previous five years, you can perhaps understand their feelings. It wasn't just obstruction. Preminari was a very serious thing, and it had destroyed Cardinal Wolsey. But gradually, Cranmer's visitation was strangled by this obstruction. In parallel to it, a lesser royal visitation had been launched, a royal visitation, but simply of the various orders of friars in the realm. But how would you do that? without any good precedent, now the break with Rome had taken effect. In practice, it was done by a royal warrant delivered to Archbishop Cranmer in spring 1534, appointing as visitors two leading friars from the Dominicans and the Austin friars. Both of them were evangelical in their outlook, personally closer to Cromwell than Cranmer, and I've no doubt that these were appointments which Cromwell arranged. For the Dominicans, there was John Hilsey, who'd now emerged as a strong preacher for evangelical reformation. For the Austins, there was none other than Cromwell's landlord at the London Austin Friars, Prior George Brown. And Cromwell soon saw to it that these two friars' efforts was reward, were rewarded with promotion to bishoprics. Yet, Hilsey and Brown also ran into difficulties over jurisdiction, just as Cranmer had done. There is a record of direct defiance from the warden of the Southampton observant Franciscans. And when Brown ventured into the northern province, he was evidently nervous. He reported with relief to Cromwell uh, when the assembled inmates of the two friaries in Beverley all did agree to my commission. Alas, the two commissioners themselves fell out. Hilsey was furious 
when in autumn 1534, the Austin Friar Brown tried to assume jurisdiction over the Dominicans as master general. The which your mastership appointed to me. And where that we, by the counsel of our whole general chapter, hath made certain assignations, he hath changed and broken them, saying that he is our master general, and that we shall do nothing but under him. Well, it was all becoming extremely messy, and needed a firm referee with clear, unchallengeable authority. The Autumn Parliament of 1534 passed a comprehensive act of supremacy, consolidating the break with Rome over the previous 18 months. This act of supremacy was brought background to the greatest expansion of Cromwell's power so far, perhaps the most important and far-reaching office he ever held. In early 1535, the king granted him a peculiar title, which in English usage had no precedent and saw no successors. Vicegerent in spirituals. Vicegerent was simply a translation of the Latin for exercising in place of, the exercise in this case being of King Henry's powers as supreme head of the church. Now, despite the novelty of this made-up name, it did have an exact and recent precedent of which Cromwell was, of course, aware the spe special papal legateship a latere exercised by his old master, Cardinal Wolsey. Wolsey had been deputy of the Pope in the Tudor realms. Vicegerent Cromwell enjoyed the same powers, overriding the two archbishops in England, and possibly the Irish archbishops too, though like everything else in Ireland, that was a bit more complicated. When Cromwell fully unveiled bureaucracy for his new office, it was strikingly like Wolsey's legatine administration, and in fact included some of the same people as its officials. The glaring difference, of course, as I observed last week, was that Wolsey, like the Pope, was an ordained priest and consecrated bishop, while Cromwell, like the King, was a layman. And it's one of the symptoms of the novelty of all this that once the vicegerency was constituted, possibly the most important executive office in the Church of England, no one was quite sure about the appropriate form of respectful address for such a beast as a vicegerent. Well, you could hardly call him your grace, certainly not your holiness. During 1535, someone on his staff, maybe the expertly oleaginous Richard Layton, must have suggested to those worried by this problem that the solution might be an equally novel, your goodness. <laughs> and the sycophantic among his staff and the church hierarchy rather self-consciously ad adopted it once in a while. But in the end, the conferring of a peerage on Cromwell in 1536 happily enabled them to say, your lordship. The royal warrant setting up the vicegerency was limited in focus to the staging of a nationwide royal visitation, which sounds like a one-off limited event. But even then, it was slow in starting. Cromwell did not even begin making any moves till the summer of 1535, rather later in the province of York, after facing down even more legal quibbles from Archbishop Lee of York. Cranmer's metropolitical visitation was finally put out of its misery by formal termination on 1st of August, 1535. And the following month, Cromwell's officials suspended the administrative powers of all the bishops in England, including the archbishops. Over the next few months, it became clear that this mass suspension was made so that Cromwell could selectively restore powers to the episcopate as he felt like it. All this open-ended exercise of the royal supremacy was on the basis of a visitation which was never actually brought to a formal end in Cromwell's lifetime. He used his powers, for instance, to visit the vacant Diocese of Hereford in 1539. In fact, if Cromwell had formally ended his visitation, it's a moot point as to whether the vicegerency would still exist. 
It's all a perfect example of his genius for improvisatory administration with amoeba-like qualities of expansion as he felt like it. There came, in the summer 1535, a major royal progress by King Henry and Queen Anne to the West Country, the perfect launch pad for action, and particularly because Henry, in ebullient mood and ex getting on extremely well with Anne, decided to make this his sign of commitment to change in the church. He went round the West Country rewarding evangelically inclined gentlemen uh, when they put him up. So this is very much a significant moment in the Reformation. It's moving away from the past. Uh, there is an outstanding doctoral thesis at the Uni uh, University of Warwick by Anthony Shaw, which is a study of the way in which the, the 1535 visitation interacted with this royal progress. Shaw discovered that the visitation was far more comprehensive than we'd realised. Over seven months, the visitation commissioners visited over 85% of the kingdom's religious houses and cathedrals, hospitals, major chantry colleges, including the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge. Cranmer allowed two arrangements of visitation to survive alongside his own. One was that for the Order of Friars, which we've, Orders of Friars, we, we've talked about. The other was for the Gilbertine Order of Monks, whose master was Robert Holgate, another evangelically inclined protégé of Cromwell's. Was this simply because of that, or because uniquely among the religious, the Gilbertines were a peculiarly uh, English order, uncontaminated by foreign papal interference? Possible. Now, the personnel uh, on the visitation were a new mix for a new purpose. They were civil and canon lawyers of Oxford and Cambridge, and so they straddled the boundary between being lay people and clerics. They could go either way as such lawyers. But their experience in diocesan administration gave them very little rapport with the monastic life, which was now their prime concern. The main concern was closeness to Thomas Cromwell or Roland Lee, his intimate friend. And Lee would no doubt have been one of their number if he'd not now moved on to higher things as Bishop of Coventry in Lichfield and Lord President of the Council in the Marches in Wales. Their inquiries had various purposes and not all negative ones. Like Cranmer's political visitation and the friar's visitation, they stacked up formal acceptances of the royal supremacy and bull in succession as they went round these various places. They also gathered detailed reports on the places they visited. And often these findings have been seen as contributions to a complete suppression of monasteries, concentrating on ferreting out sexual scandal. But their investigations co covered many other topics on, on which, arguably, reform was needed from any point of view. Uh, well, perhaps mostly from an evangelical humanist point of view. For instance, detailed provisions for preaching, biblical study to enrich the devotional life of monastic communities. Great reform-minded monasteries, such as Cromwell himself visited in the West Country this summer, his favourite house of Winchcombe among them, might welcome much of this programme. But one glaring and consistent absence from the visitors' inquiries anywhere was much concern with community worship, either proper attendance at it or proper conduct of it. That had been a staple of inquiry in visitations over centuries. But the vice-gerential team, not least Thomas Cromwell himself, apparently had no great investment in the traditional liturgy of the Western Church. The visitation did change in character as the months went on during the long royal progress. And uniquely, Cromwell was with the king and queen for virtually all the progress. That's another distinctive feature of this uh, 1535 progress. But the disadvantage uh, for Cromwell in the king being close at hand was that his majesty might be seized by one of his periodic fits of interest in what was going on. At the beginning of August, the king became irritably aware that proposed general injunctions for the visitors to enforce had not yet been issued, contrary to traditional good practice. 
So he scolded Cromwell for the negligence, who in turn scolded his visitors. A defensive letter from Richard Leighton ill conceals irritation and anxiety. Leighton rushed back to the court at Berkeley Castle from Cirencester Abbey to help in a major drafting of injunctions which st should stand for ever. And a draft of those injunctions survives, maybe from that very day at Berkeley Castle. A fair copy with some practical tinkerings in Cromwell's own hand. Interestingly, none of his tinkerings made it to the final text. One of his emendations proposed modifies the ban on boys in the company of monks, which of course is a measure which would bear considerable fruit as the visitors decided to look for sexual scandal. Cromwell proposed an exception for boys serving at mass. Very sensible. Equally sensible, and yet equally not taken up, was a provision for a licensing system for women to visit monasteries. Conversely, Cromwell tried to remove an order for monks to say a daily mass for the souls of the monastic founder. He converted it instead in his emendation to a simple provision for prayers for the king and the queen. The king must have decided that this undermining of intercessory masses was too radical a move, and so the visitors didn't enforce it. All this, then, sounds like King Henry calling the shots at Berkeley Castle. Altogether, the king's sudden enthusiasm for radical monastic austerity was not helpful, suggesting a delight in ordering reforms without thinking through the consequences, characteristic of the man. The blanket order excluding women from male religious communities was all very well, but alongside its laudable aim of excluding ladies of lurid reputation, it omitted any consideration of the eminently respectable elderly folk who'd made formal arrangements for a devout retirement alongside communities of their choice. But that was not all. One brief and totally novel order, that no monk or brother of this monastery by any means go forth of the precinct of the same, caused immediate problems and then months of appalled reaction from monastic heads. What would the prohibition mean when communities needed to collect their rents at Michaelmas, let alone any more general business? Well, the immediate result was a vicious row between two visitors, Dr. Richard Leighton and Dr. Thomas Lee. Leighton, the priest, applied the orders flexibly. Lee, the lawyer, applied them strictly. John Ap Rees, Cromwell's nephew by marriage, implicitly cr criticised Lee to their master. Matters descended into farce at Bruton Abbey in Somerset, when on the 23rd of August, Thomas Lee directly contradicted Leighton's recent pr permission to the abbot to leave the precinct, and then wrote in fury to the vicegerent denouncing his colleague. Cromwell had to rush away from court up in Gloucestershire all the way down to Somerset, personally to knock heads together. It was a personality clash reminiscent of that spat I've already described to you the previous autumn between the Friar Commissioners, Brown and Hilsey. Both these rows were a result of entering uncharted waters in jurisdiction with insufficient guidelines or precedents. When the Royal Progress reached Winchester, September 1535, there were further developments. The visitors were now enjoined to inquire more broadly about cases of sodomy and incontinence to include voluntarie polluciones, masturbation. Now, there was no precedent in canon law or visitorial, visitorial practice for such a systematic inquiry on this embarrassing subject. The stately royal foundation of Chertsey Abbey has the dubious distinction of being the first foundation to make an affirmative response to this question about voluntarie polluciones, about 26th or 27th of September, 1535. And Dr. Leighton's act book was suddenly full of sexual misdemeanor, previously no more than a gentle trickle of cases. The book's now lost, but it's preserved in summary form in a muckraking publication of that prurient Protestant bishop, John Bale. 
From now on, the visitation began collecting scandal quite deliberately to discredit monastic life in the eyes of the English public. We can't know for certain whose idea this was, but it does suggest the fussy prudishness of King Henry VIII, wedded to a new determination to close as many monasteries as he could get away with. During the autumn, Cromwell continued to make up visitation policy on the hoof, and his visitors were sometimes slow to catch up with the latest alteration. By mid-October, he thought better of a visitation requirement for monks and nuns younger than 24 to leave their communities. Perhaps prompted by the discovery of Cardinal Wolsey's 23-year-old daughter among the nuns of Shaftesbury Abbey. John Apris wrote a harassed letter to him on the 22nd of October about this changed requirement. Toler Cromwell, never tolerant of foot dragging, had been constrained to repeat an order to the visitors not to expel anyone over 20. Now, you could describe this change as responsiveness to reality. Cromwell was becoming aware that the 20 to 24-year-old cohort was more reluctant to quit the monastic life than he expected not just one distressed young nun at Shaftesbury. A further development was an order to the visitors to inquire into the history of monastic founders, to see which houses were royal foundations and might therefore more easily be commandeered. This was encouraged by a memorandum from some government lawyer suggesting that my, merely by examining royal foundations and seizing the property of those in breach of the founders' regulations, it's going to be all, isn't it? The king would regain £40,000 of revenue every year. Well, at this stage, such a proposal was absurdly impractical. As so often in schemes around attacks on church wealth, it represented a possible direction of travel to be taken in the right political circumstances. But the inquiry had another dimension. Among all the nobility of England who could count themselves heirs to pious Anglo-Norman monastic founders, the greatest tally of ancient titles was clutched by Cromwell's chief rival, Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, who was smarting from his political marginalization and never neglectful of his own profit. Cromwell soon became aware that Crom at Norfolk had a, launched a private enterprise of dissolution on his own account in his own East Anglian heartland, closing down a sequence of small East Anglian family monasteries associated with his forebears. Where the Duke led the way, other East Anglian gentry enthusiastically followed. Now, this flow of private asset stripping must be stopped and surrenders at least regularised. Yet in autumn 1535, there was no legal way of actually preventing them. And it was not surprising that in this deteriorating situation, Cromwell resumed the policy of individual monastic dissolutions in the Crown's interest, which, as we saw last week, he had tried out in 1532. The new closures had the same justification, failure in finance, the pretext for the closure of Christchurch Church Aldate. And in a series of seven royal dissolutions from November 1535 to February 1536, almost identical wording was used in the deeds of surrender. It was all about finance, despite the fact that in some cases it's clear there really was lurid sexual scandal which might have provided good reason for suppression. So nothing at this stage suggests a general plan to end monasticism. The visitation's work up to the beginning of Parliament that does consistently reveal an aim to thin out the ranks in the regular life using criteria of misdemeanor, youth, or a false vocation. And the terms of these uh, injunctions resulted in far more dismissals from the monastic life than anyone realised before Dr Shaw. Perhaps 1,700 monks out of a total of around 9,000 in the country at the time, mainly relying on the provisions for dismissing those younger than 24, despite the problems around that uh, figure. Nevertheless, the sequence of ad hoc but sequence dissolutions that autumn strongly suggests 
that on the very eve of the first parliament of 1536, which enacted the first general measure of dissolution, no definite decision had been taken on how to proceed. This likelihood is backed up by a fragmentary reminiscence among the family papers of Cromwell's Kentish Protestant friends, the Wyatts. A late Tudor account of the Reformation, which is tragically incomplete, but in other respects independently well informed. The context of this anecdote shows that the incident took place in early 1536. And what it was about was the question of a major program of dissolutions which came before the King's Council. Cromwell counsel counselled caution on the King and his Council with good reason. For when the late Cardinal Wolsey had obtained Your Majesty's favour and licence of the Bishop of Rome to dissolve certain monasteries for the building of his colleges at Oxford and Ipswich, yet the same were it never so gently done and circumspectly used, and that one and one was not done without some disquiet, as everybody knoweth. Wherefore, mine advice, Cromwell, mine advice is that it should be done by little and little, not suddenly by Parliament. And I doubt not, but seeing how horrible this kind of monastic life is, and how odious to the wiser sort of people, they may be easily persuaded to leave their monastic cowls and to render their possessions to your majesty, by whose progenitors they were first erected. The writer then claims that Lord Chancellor Audley and his colleague, the ambitious lawyer, civil servant Richard Rich, prevailed against this advice, successfully arguing for parliamentary act to dissolve the lesser monasteries and the erection of a court of augmentations to administer their wealth. Now, this leading role of Richard Rich corresponds to a remark of the French ambassador at the time of Cromwell's fall in 1540, that Rich was first divisor of the casting down of abbeys and all that was newly done in the church, so that he devised and Cromwell lent his authority. Official uncertainty about how to proceed in this parliament is palpable. One symptom is a surviving fair copy draft of a bill for Parliament on the monasteries. It bears no relation to the end result in enactment and has therefore been neglected and misunderstood, but it is definitely for this Parliament, spring 1536. It concentrates on denouncing the promotion of pilgrimages, miraculous images and relics by monks and provides the, for the ejection of any monk who had done so, promoted all these superstitions. So it was on the thinning out side of the strategy, thinning out the ranks, an alternative to systematic suppression, a possibility which the draft did not mention at all. Instead, the draft spent much time denouncing religious who exploited their pretensed holiness and piety and simulate poverty to give respectability to popish errors. The implication was that other monks, nuns and friars managed to avoid such pitfalls. It's a program for a reformed but drastically slimmed down monastic polity. Now this draft bill is in the hand of one of the most senior clerks to Cromwell's visitation commissioners, Robert Warmington by name. Not only does it reflect what the commissioners had done, in selectively dismissing monks and nuns and gathering discreditable data, but it closely echoes wording in some of their injunctions. It highlights the reforming work of the visitation past and future, and it places a broad power of dispensation in Cromwell's hands as vicar general and vicegerent, and that may be one reason why it failed in Parliament. This, therefore, was no mere kite-flying speculation, but it was an official path not trodden. It also dovetails exactly with Cromwell's preferred plan presented in that Wyatt narrative fragment. By the end of the month March, a very different suppression measure passed Parliament, affecting only smaller monasteries with an annual income of less than £200. Its preamble took, get, took pains to praise divers great and solemn monasteries where thanks be to God 
religion is right well kept and observed. We need not think that in 1536, suppression of the smaller monasteries was a blind to hide a covert scheme for eventual universal dissolution. What was genuinely new was that the legislation also addressed the evidence of monastic vice provided by Cromwell's visitors, specifically referring to the term compets, which they used for their summary finding. Now, the evidence of these competa, however much it was muckraking, did indeed reveal that the largest concentration of misdemeanors was in the smaller monastic houses. The bigger the monastery, the lower the rate of crime, was Dr. Shaw's uh, finding. Great and solemn indeed, Winchcombe Abbey and its fellows. Meanwhile, Relations between Queen Anne and Cromwell dramatically worsened in winter 1536. And it was at this stage, after the Queen miscarried of another child, that Cromwell began plotting with Henry's now bastardised daughter, the Lady Mary, to have Mary recognised as heir to the throne. In the last frenzied month of Queen Anne's life, Anne and Cromwell clashed bitterly over monasteries. She made vigorous efforts in these weeks to oppose the programme of suppression which Parliament had just passed. No doubt aware of Cromwell's discomfiture in that legislation, Anne was making a bold bid to become herself the champion of a positive and evangelical reform of monastic life. Her erstwhile chaplain, William Latimer, later reminisced to Queen Elizabeth about a preaching campaign which Anne launched in her last month of life. According to Latimer, Anne ordered Bishop Hugh Latimer, no relation, to use his first available sermon before the king to implore him not to persist in the utter subversion of the said houses and to convert them to some better use. Latimer then says, that the Queen bullied heads of monastic houses who came to her, encouraged by this message, into providing money for university scholarships. And it's true that in the later 1530s there was a surge in monks taking university degrees. Archbishop Cranmer was out of the loop on all this, down in Kent at Knoll, and he was alarmed at the confusing messages he was now getting from court. He wrote to Cromwell to seek a face-to-face -face clarifying word as the cause of religion, monasticism, goeth all contrary to mine expectation, if it be as the fame goeth. Anne was bidding to wrest leadership of Reformation from its other chief champions, especially Cromwell. To cut short both a long story and the Queen herself, she failed. That summer of 1536, with Anne dead, there are significant signs of Cromwell trying to slow the process of dissolution. One case was unsuccessful, the much-respected Northamptonshire nunnery of Catesby, which closed despite strong lobbying of the King by both Cromwell and the new Queen, Jane Seymour. The other was a success and is of great significance. The London Charter House, the Carthusian House of London. Cromwell's name is always blackened in relation to the Charter House and there's no doubt that he was deeply personally involved in the executions there which were among King Henry VIII's worst atrocities. But Cromwell's personal involvement reflects the fact that he was indeed deeply personally involved with the Charter House, passionately concerned to remould this community to his will in a reformed style. During the 1535 visitation, Cromwell determined on an extraordinarily elaborate and painstaking strategy for the Charter House, might mapped out in special vicegerential instructions for them, for lay governors who took over the running of the London Charter House from the executed prior, John Houghton. The aim was not to dissolve the house, but to turn it into a reformed evangelical monastic community with a changed ethos, based on intensive biblical study, Bibles to be provided by the commissioners. Cromwell sent in evangelical servants to live in the community and persuade the Carthusians to change their mode of life. Not a great success, but a genuine try. 
And all this was backed up by a royal pardon for any of the surviving community for all heresies and treasons by any of them committed before that day. In September 1536, end of that summer, Cromwell received a confidential letter from Rafe Sadler, whom he'd placed as his eyes and ears in the king's privy chamber. Sadler told Cromwell that that evening he happened to remind the king that the Brigitine nuns at Zion needed a new superior. This jerked Henry's memory to an allied subject and not in a good way. The king snapped at Sadler. The charter house in London is not ordered as I would have it. I commanded, quoth he, my Lord Privy Seal a great while ago to put the monks out of the house, and now he wrote to you that they be reconciled. But seeing that they have been so long obstinate, I will not now admit their obedience, and so write to my Lord Privy Seal. Sadler commented tactfully, this his grace commanded me to write to your lordship as I do, which as you shall have opportunity, ye may temper with his grace, as by your wisdom shall be thought convenient. In other words, Sadler knew that Cromwell was trying to preserve the charter house against the king's evident determination that it should be destroyed. And after appropriate tempering with his royal master, Cromwell succeeded for another two years. He appointed a new prior who'd previously defied the royal supremacy, and two-thirds of the community followed the new prior Trafford in accepting the royal supremacy. Once more, we meet Cromwell, the defender of monasteries. A few days after Sadler's letter came the devastating news of risings in Lincolnshire, and then in the north of England in the Pilgrimage of Grace, they nearly brought down the whole regime, and Cromwell in particular. He was undoubtedly the chief target of all this trouble. And the rebels, consistently from day one of their risings, restored suppressed religious houses. Their eventual failure to force their program on the king radically reshaped politics. But can we see their defeat as leading to an inevitable dissolution of the monasteries? Matters were still more complicated than that. We've seen Thomas Cromwell in alliance with Queen Jane Seymour over Catesby Nunnery, and that was only one symptom of his strong alignment with the new Seymour regime. And that was dramatically shown in summer 1537 when his son Gregory, now 17, married the slightly older sister of Queen Jane, Elizabeth Seymour was maybe, maybe 19, uh, but this was already her second marriage and she brought two children to it. But it was still an extraordinary coup for the brewer's son from Putney. One person who found it particularly extraordinary was the biggest snob in all England, Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk. No congratulations for the wedding survived from him nor on Thomas Cromwell's new honour of knighthood of the garter, a natural promotion for the father of the king's brother-in-law. Instead, a series of territorial adjustments that autumn show the Duke of Norfolk being compensated for this radical unbalancing of Tudor politics. His long-term rival in East Anglia, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, was prevailed on to move his estates and power base to Lincolnshire. That provided a useful local governor for Lincolnshire in the wake of rebellion, but also reduced the quota of dukes in East Anglia to one. The previous year, Cromwell had been granted a handsome estate in Norfolk at North Elmham, probably intending it to be the capital mansion for Gregory Cromwell when he got married. A Cromwell was no more welcome there than a Brandon to Thomas Howard. Accordingly, the two men did a deal. Cromwell actually offered North Elmham to the Duke, who in the end lost interest in it because Gregory was now destined for a fine house a very long way away in south southernmost Sussex. This change of direction was all the more striking because the developing Cromwell dynasty had neither existing estates nor historic connections with the area. The place chosen was the stately Cluniac Priory of Lewis, 
which, if all Clunic priories were not all priories of their mother house in France, would have amply justified the name of Abbey alongside the greatest Benedictine houses. It was, in fact, the senior Cluniac house in England, delectably situated in a river valley, spreading comfortably out below the town of Lewis. Its founder by succession from 11th century Earls of Surrey was none other than Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. Lewis offered a very suitable case for dissolution, since it was pleasantly remote from Howard's main territorial concern. Lewis Priory was also handily linked to a subsidiary Cluniac house, which by contrast interested the Duke very much, Castle Acre in Norfolk. He proceeded to obtain this for himself as a virtual gift from the king. Now, the fact of that royal gift uh, would in itself be a sure sign that Castle Acre was part of a wider deal. But we have the Duke of Norfolk's own letter to Cromwell, 4th of November, 1537, from Hampton Court, described with cons describing with considerable satisfaction how the king was content to give us Lewis if we might bring the bargain to pass saying and rehearsing further concerning your service done to him, no less than I said to you in your garden, crafty duke. This intricate deal had other elements. Another royal gift brought Cromwell his first outright possession of any monastery at all, also in Sussex, Augustinian Mitchelham, a lesser house than Lewis, a perfect secondary retreat for Gregory. 60 miles west along the south coast, at the same time, Cromwell's principal secretary, Thomas Risley, was set up with a third royal gift. A gift, you notice, not a purchase, a gift. A substantial monastery for his capital mansion, Premonstratensian Titchfield Abbey, just outside Southampton. Now, this was usefully located to skew power structures in Hampshire, away from the control of Risley's former master and present enemy, Bishop Stephen Gardner. Results became apparent in contests for county elections to Parliament in 1539, where Risley did extremely well with his cli uh, clientage. Lewis and Titchfield between them gave Cromwell the prospect of two reliable centres of power in southern counties. Also striking in the Lewis business is the extreme haste of the deal. It was a complicated transaction involving simultaneous surrender of Lewis and a substantial and far distant sale at Castle Acre, and Castle Acre in other circumstances would itself have been a ma major monastic dissolution. Cromwell and the Duke were nervous about Theatres rather rashly tried to make the deal absolutely foolproof by adding to its other elements a legal fiction used in the Court of Common Pleas to secure land transfers known as levying a fine, that is, a common law conveyance from the monastic head to the crown. Lord Chancellor Audley, punctilious to a fault in matters of co common law, pointed out to Cromwell the problems of legal logic in such a process for Titchfield. But despite Audley's worries, thereafter levying a fine was repeatedly used in monastic surrenders. And consequently, one of the elements in the parliamentary legislation of 1539, tidying up by then uh, what was an avalanche of dissolutions, was to give full statutory backing to this shaky legal procedure. Lewis's surrender was clinched by throwing money at the problem. Cromwell made an unprecedented offer of permanent pensions for all the monks unless they were granted or obtained preferment in the Church of England of equivalent value, plus a golden handshake, plus a year's wages for all the non-monastic staff. Risley immediately copied this deal at Titchfield, as did the other beneficiary of all this scheming uh, uh, balancing act of 1537-38, the Duke of Suffolk, who had, uh, had a, a, a new uh, house at Reevesby Abbey in Lincolnshire. And this then provided the model for all subsequent surrenders of cooperative monasteries thereafter, though in fact the crown paid pension liability, not the owner, in future. So this was a move of much general significance. No member of a monastic community need fear a future of poverty, a great incentive to accept dissolution, especially when the alternative might be death by attainder. 
So Gregory Crummell's wedding in August 1537 had momentous consequences. Further suppressions now swelled into a flood, to the extent that Cromwell found himself financially disadvantaged. In the course of his long involvement with monastic affairs, he'd accumulated so many grants of fees from monasteries that he now felt their loss. A partial solution only emerged in spring 1538, when he was awarded the stewardship of all suppressed monasteries north of the Trent, plus a set of named dissolved houses all around the kingdom, an office with a handsome fee of £100 a year. As surrenders accumulated in 1537, it had become clear that a mode of proceeding was necessary for monastic houses outside the scope of the First Dissolution Act, and for which there was neither a pretext of treason nor that rationale of debt or misrule first employed at Christchurch Allgate back in 1532. What if there was no reason to dissolve a monastery? Well, that is precisely what was dealt with at Titchfield and Lewis and Mitchellham. But still, even at this late date, there seems no general plan for monastic dissolution, certainly not in the mind of the Duke of Norfolk. He took care to translate with all due reverence the principal relic of Castle Acre Priory, the arm of St. Philip, to the Cluniac House of Thetford, his own mausoleum uh, priory, and he was encouraging that house to become a local hub for conservative religion in East Anglia. So this is going to be a, a new shrine in a surviving monastery. The following summer, uh, 1538, <clears throat> came a separate suite which in 12 months destroyed all the friaries in England and Wales. You would, because they were the preaching centres for the old religion. You've got to get rid of them. But there also came an interesting alternative future for monasteries. The monasteries still standing untouched were the bedrock of the English monastic system, mostly the great Benedictine houses of Anglo-Saxon antiquity, the great and solemn monasteries praised in the 1536 legislation. And there's good evidence that many of such houses would have responded quite positively to Cromwell's injunctions for their good conduct back in 1535. Once you quietly laid aside the impractical things added by Henry VIII, it was possible for a conscientious abbot to warm to the vicegerent's instructions for scholarship, study, Bible reading, proper communal life, and dignified abbatial hospitality. The model the injunctions reinforced reflected a conscious shift in style in a group of leading Benedictine and Cistercian monasteries in progress well before Cromwell came to power. These, <coughs> the <coughs> these flagships of an ancient monastic tradition were moving of their own accord to a life more resembling the great Chantry Colleges of England. Such a policy was precisely what Cardinal Wolsey, ably assisted by Thomas Cromwell, had forwarded in the, in the 1520s with St. Frideswide's Priory, Oxford, and St. Peter's Priory, Ipswich. He had turned them into colleges. To do this might be regarded as a measure of Catholic reform, but an evangelical reformer could equally well sympathize. Secular clergy could pray as well as any monk but also contribute more to the church as a whole. Chantry colleges so far remained untouched by government policy and for the most part flourished. Such institutions as Fotheringay, St Mary's Warwick or St George's Chapel Windsor. They were closer in their life and even architectural layout to the new clutch of Oxbridge colleges of Tudor Foundation than they might seem today. Stoke by Clare College in Suffolk provided a textbook example of how colleges beyond the universities might continue in a moderate evangelical splendour, combining solemn liturgical observance with preaching, provision for children's education, as well as being, in this case, a favourite retreat for Cambridge Dons. The master of Stoke was Matthew Parker, future Archbishop of Canterbury an appointee chaplain of Anne Bullen, and he doubled as head of a Cambridge college, Corpus Christi. 
Parker took trouble to write new statutes for Stoke when he took over in 1535, getting no lesser a humanist than John Cheek to turn them into mellifluous and up-to-date Latin. This, then, is how a group of Benedictine abbots had been thinking for some decades. Such heads of house as Islip and Benson of Westminster, Crummell's friend Kidderminster of Winchcombe, or his protégés Sager of Hales and Hawford of Evesham. They were encouraged by the proliferation of specifically monastic colleges, particularly at Oxford, providing accommodation for Benedictines and Augustinians and Cistercians studying in the university. These institutions were rather paradoxical, a contradiction of monastic enclosure, but an affirmation of monastic scholarship. They began emerging in the late 13th century, but a remarkable development among them is specific to the 1530s. In the last five years before the final monastic dissolutions, more Benedictine monks took Oxford degrees than in any period in the previous 40 years. The highest numbers were in the last two years. Some members continued, continued studying in the universities after the dissolutions. Indeed, it's not at all certain how final the dissolution of the Oxbridge monastic colleges actually was. Unlike the former Oxbridge friaries, all gone, most eventually saw refoundation under new names, actually beginning in Cambridge with Lord Chancellor Audley's remodelling of Cambridge's only monastic college, Buckingham, as Magdalen College. This phenomenon shows the intellectual liveliness of Tudor Benedictines, and had it con continued on the same trajectory, it would have resulted in the greatest English monasteries behaving more and more like Oxbridge colleges, that also reflected government thinking in 1538. There was much anticipation that major Benedictine and Augustinian monasteries would be remodeled as colleges. As central a government figure as Chancellor Audley proposed Colchester and St. Osith's, the fiery evangelical Bishop Hugh Latimer mooted Great Malvern, further suggesting two or three such foundations in each county. Abbot Sager of Hales put forward his own house. The unanimity across the religious spectrum is striking. This was actually government policy. Cromwell himself, extraordinarily, put some effort into proposing Little Walsingham, purged, of course, of its shrine, uh, like Hales would be purged of its blood relic. His northern evangelical client, Prior Robert Ferrer, was advocate late, like Sagar of his own house at Nostel Priory as a preaching centre and school. And the Duke of Norfolk, similarly for the Howard Mausoleum Church of Thetford, the Cluniac House. The Duke, remarkably, proposed to use Matthew Parker's evangelically inspired new statutes for Stoke College as the model for his new Thetford College, having already obtained the King's consent for the transformation. And Ferrer's plan also sounds like an imitation of Stoke, a conscious, direct imitation of Stoke. The decisive blow to this expansive plan of remodelling many greater houses came from a voice not to be ignored, King Henry. In 1538, the Holy Roman Emperor and the King of France had finally come to an understanding, and Henry was isolated. He felt desperately vulnerable. And from January 1539 onwards, that sent him scurrying to his military engineers for a great southern coastal defence programme. State-of-the-art Tudor strong points still there from St Michael's Mount to Lowestoft. Brand new fortifications costing huge amounts. No other single countrywide scheme was built on the same scale before the 19th and 20th centuries. Such expenditure made a confiscation of estates from the remaining monasteries all the more tempting. Nevertheless, despite the financial windfall from great monastic closures during 1539, fragments of the previous plans remained. Two great abbeys, Thornton in North Lincolnshire and Burton of Trent in Staffordshire, did indeed become colleges on a generous scale pure specimens of the scheme, and they remained on their new course into the 1540s. 
Adding to the sense of open-mindedness in these events, they must have continued in their communal life before their official refoundation, just quietly staying there, rather like those supposedly dissolved monastic colleges in Oxbridge. In the case of Burton Abbey, the continuing encouragement may have come from the evangelical former abbot who was now abbot of Westminster, William Benson. He also secured an extraordinarily lavish future settlement for Westminster. Besides those two survivors, the remaining monastic cathedrals were remodeled and some abbeys promoted to new cathedrals, Westminster among them in numbers which remained a mat matter of debate while Cromwell was uh, in prison and being executed. As preparations for Parliament took shape in early 1539, the future of the monasteries remained untidy and uncertain, and maybe thereafter too. The last monastic closures took place between January and March 1540. So really, the New Year's gift list for the king that January 1540 still included gifts from three monastic heads of house, Waltham, Westminster and Christchurch Canterbury. And since two of those institutions survived, it's likely that the abbot of Waltham expected continuance too. He was, after all, head of one of the most senior royal foundations in the realm, and his house was on the more expansive draft lists of new dioceses and cathedrals. In the event, Waltham was the very last abbey to be suppressed without a successor institution on the 23rd of March, 1540. Still, no decision to close all monasteries had ever been made public. The dissolution of the monasteries was not a certainty until it was complete. What it was not was a long-term scheme authored by Thomas Cromwell. Where he might have taken it next is buried with his bones very near those of his arch enemy, Queen Anne Bullen, in the Tower of London. But if we've finished with monasteries, we've not finished with Thomas Cromwell's religion, to which I return in my last lecture with one or two surprises. Thank you.